Welcome to our math and science show. This is another episode of Quarantine, and this one is a little bit different today because we have turned off our chat on YouTube. And we want to take a minute before we get started with our science lesson about refrigeration, we're going to talk a little bit about internet safety, about why we have a chat, our rules for it, <coughs> excuse me, our rules for it, and why it is off temporarily today. We will be turning it back on in, in a few minutes. I want to say hello to and welcome to those who are watching live and a special welcome to you if you're watching our replay. Hello to Jamie from Minnesota, to Christine, and to Science Cat from New Jersey. Hey, it's Corgi from Minnesota, Maureen and Nathan from Texas, Lila from California, and Logan from California, and Sarah from South Carolina. We're so happy to have you with us. Hello to Amy from Iowa and Sophia from South Carolina as well. And hello to Jen from Ottawa. Thank you for joining us today. Now, Math Dad, how should we start this discussion about our chat and about live streaming? If well, I'd ask I, 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 I like the golden rule as a good starting point for any discussion on how we should be interacting with others. So, so the golden rule is you should treat others the way that you would like to be treated. Or even better, I like the, don't do things to other people that you don't want to happen to you. Um, kind of the, like the inverse of that. Yeah. Now, if you had asked Math Dad and I, even just four months ago, if we would ever live stream every day, we would have been like, ha ha, that's ridiculous. No, we would never do that. But when schools got closed, we wanted to help and we started quarantine and we have just loved being able to have it be interactive because learning is so much better when it's interactive. But if you're learning something and you have too many distractions, it becomes more difficult. So as an example, I'm going to explain real quick what matter is made of, and I want you to pay attention to what Math Dad is doing. So in example one, he's gonna be interacting in a way that just gives emphasis. So here is my little mini 20 second lesson on matter. Matter is made of atoms. Atoms are really tiny, little minuscule particles that you can't even see with a microscope, and they make up everything. There are more than 100 different types of elements, and if you combine different elements together, you get molecules. And this is what the material around us is made of. So, not super interactive, but he did give that little thing at the end, and that was kind of fun. And you could see that he was paying attention because of the little, you know, he's being quiet and listening, and then he gave that response. Now, let's see what happens if I teach the same little lesson, and I want you to see how much of it you are able to pay attention to, if math dad is being a little distracting. Atoms make up everything around us, and they are tiny, tiny little particles that you can't even see without a <laughs> And atoms are made, uh, there are more than 100 different types of atoms, and they, when you combine them together, they make compounds, and, <laughs> and that is what the world around you is made of. So you can see that this is distracting. And it actually took away from the learning because you were distracted by what Math Dad was doing. And our chat is a little bit like that as well. If our chat is working well, it is so much fun. You're able to interact with each other and with us. We can ask you questions. You guys can give responses as we're teaching. But if the chat gets too off topic, then it actually becomes really distracting. If there is a little, you know, what's better, carrots or turnips? And there's a little war going back and forth with people talking about carrots and turnips, but what we're supposed to be talking about is how a fridge works, then it becomes difficult to pay attention. So, <laughs> and people are asking, why, why were you whistling that song? You know, just, it, it just, just came to mind. Just came to mind. <clears throat> so here are the rules for our chat. And then I'm gonna tell you a little story about why, why we turned it off today. So rule number one, no spam. So spam is anything that is completely irrelevant. So if you're just typing out like, the letter M, you know, 50 times, and then you hit return and you just keep doing that again and again, and the whole entire chat fills up with M, 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 M. That's distracting and it's irrelevant. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. So no, no repeated comments, please, in the chat. That's rule number one. Rule number two is to show respect. So treat other people kindly, treat other people with respect, and treat us with respect too. That's an important part of being a member of our chat. And then number three, and this is the important rule, and this is why it's turned off today. Rule number three is no sharing personal information. And here is why. So I, I think yeah, saying what state you're from. That's totally fine. Not, not, not a problem. That, that, that's, that's good. No one's going to track you down or not know who you are or what, what that means. But 
Um, yeah, so what do you mean by personal information? I mean email addresses. You don't share your email address in our chat and you don't share your physical address where you live in the chat. Now, he, um, here is why, okay? I want you to pretend, I'm gonna tell you a little story. Pretend like when you were chatting online, you're actually talking with magical animals. And most magical animals in this virtual world are amazing. If you become friends with a flying dog, the flying dog will remember your birthday and the flying dog will cheer you up when you're sad. I shouldn't have said remember your birthday. The flying dog will cheer you up when you're sad and it will be your friend. But there is one type of animal that you have to watch out for. They're very rare, but they are polka dotted teleporting hippopotamuses. And anytime that you are chatting online in this little analogy that we have, there is a chance that you could be chatting with a teleporting polka dotted hippopotamus. And the hippopotamus is not gonna say, I'm a hippopotamus. It's gonna pretend to be one of the awesome animals like a flying dog or a rainbow colored cat. And the, the hippopotamus, if it finds out where you live, it will teleport to your house and it will eat all your food and all your toilet paper. Yeah, so you gotta, we, you gotta watch out for those yeah, hippos. Do yeah. we want to encounter a teleporting hippopotamus? Nope. No, we do not. So this is why, this is kind of a good analogy for why you should protect your personal information. In the real world, most of the people you're gonna encounter are wonderful people, but you've gotta watch out for the few that are not, and this is why you guard your personal information. So now- Stay away from my food. <laughs> in, right. in, our, in our chat, and I don't want anyone, and this is why one of the reasons why we turned it off, because I knew that there would be a lot of people who would be upset that the chat was off, and I don't want anyone trying to think like, aha, I bet it was this person, and then being unkind to them and saying it's your fault that our chat is turned off because our second rule that's very important is to show respect. And we all make mistakes. Have you made mistakes? I have made mistakes, yes. Definitely, and I have too. And if someone made the mistake of wanting to share their email address and then wanting to contact someone else, we don't, wanna, we don't want to get all mad at them and say it's your fault that the chat is off, but it's serious enough that I really wanted to make a point about it you're not allowed to share your email addresses on our chat. And then I want you to make sure that you remember that rule, okay? And I would also say that when you spam the chat, it makes it so we can't read the comments and interact. So it kind of kills the point of us even having the chat available. If everything's just, people are just typing the letter M or whatever your what, spamming whatever it is. looks like, yeah. Yep. So please, right. please remember that. And we will we will turn the chat back on after after our science lesson. So those of you who are watching on YouTube who are missing the chat, it will come back on today. And remember our three rules, our three rules are to show respect. Maybe that should have been number one. That's the one that's most important to me, show respect. So I don't want there to be any type of hunting for who was it that shared email addresses. And you can't go back and look either because our moderator hid the email addresses. And so they were visible for just a second and then they're gone and no one else can see them. But still, it's a serious enough thing to us that, all right, and Matt, Dad's like, all right, come on, all right, all right, wrap yeah. it up. Enough lecture here. <laughs> no sharing personal information and no spam. All Those right. are our rules for our chat. And now, what's the science lesson? Matt, Dad is really ready. He's like, let's talk about science. The science is refrigeration. Mm -hmm. Refrigeration transformed the world. And we really appreciate this because we live in Las Vegas. So, Matt, Dad, could we survive here in July without air conditioning? <sighs> I don't know. It would it'd be tough. <laughs> it would be really tough. Where we live in the summertime, it gets so hot. We actually had our air conditioner break about five years ago, and it broke during a heat wave when it was 117 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of the day. And when it, when it broke and stopped working, I had all the windows closed. I put curtains in front of the windows, and I thought, well, we can probably last for about two days, and that'll give me some time to like you know try and compare prices and see how we can get our air conditioning fixed. Within six hours, it was 97 degrees inside our house. And that was with us not opening any doors, which made me think that our house is not nearly as well insulated as I thought. And we were just desperate. And we got, you know, got called to get a new air conditioner fixed, but it wasn't gonna happen for two days. And we had to sleep at friends' houses because it was so hot at night, we couldn't sleep. And the people who built the town where we live in, they built it back before air conditioning. And at nighttime during the summer, they actually used to dip sheets in water and then wrap the sheets around themselves and go to sleep. And then you would wake up when the sheet was dry and you would go dip it in water again and wrap it around yourself because it's really hard to sleep. If it's close to 100 degrees, you have a hard time falling asleep and staying asleep. 
So because we have air conditioning, we were able to we're able to live in climates where it might be really difficult to live otherwise. We've got it easy now, yikes. We that, do, we tough. really do. <clears throat> so how does an air conditioner work? Well, to understand how an air conditioner works, to understand how a fridge works, you really need to know a few things about evaporation. So I have a really quick little example that we're going to do. And if you would like to do this one at home, this one's very easy and really kind of fascinating to do. So I have a container of water, a container of oil, and then a container with a little bit of rubbing alcohol. And here's what we're going to do. I was about to put this on the laptop and Math Dad's eyes are just don't like, do it. No, don't do it. So first, Math Dad, we are going to put just a little drop of oil on the backs of our hands, just a tiny bit of oil here, tiny bit of oil there. And then you hold your hand about eight inches away and blow on it really gently. <laughs> Do you notice any temperature difference? Does your hand feel different? Not at all. Not at all. Come over this way so they can see you. I don't notice any temperature difference at all it's either. It's weird. I expected it to. You expected it to be colder, but it wasn't. Now we're going to get just a little bit of water. So a little, little drop of water there, a little drop of water there. And you can kind of rub it in just a little bit. Okay. And now blow. <laughs> Do you feel the temperature drop? T totally feel yeah. the temperature drop. You can feel that it gets colder. And now this one is the most impressive, in my opinion. Tiny bit of rubbing alcohol. You ready? I'm ready. So tiny bit of rubbing alcohol there. And I'm going to put some on my hand here. And now blow. Whoa. Way colder, right? Yeah. Now, why did we feel a temperature drop with the oil and with the rubbing alcohol? But I'm sorry, with the water and the rubbing alcohol, but not with the oil. Why did we have a temperature drop with two of those liquids, but not with the third? Does anyone have any guesses? I think you kind of uh, gave it away when you said evaporation. Is that Evaporation has a lot to do with it. Now, here's the thing. Anytime that you are breaking chemical bonds, you are going to be requiring energy. And that energy is going to be pulled from the environment around. Now, oil, when you have oil next to each other, they're not bonded together. But water is. Water shares hydrogen bonds with other water molecules, and rubbing alcohol is the same way. Oh, I don't need toilet paper. I just rubbed it on my shirt. Oh, <laughs> my shirt. That's me wearing my shirt. <laughs> Sorry, oh. <laughs> <man. Yeah. laughs> Rubbing alcohol has bonds too, and when those bonds break and the molecules evaporate, then it pulls heat from the environment. And so you can feel this if you try it yourself. If you put a little bit of oil on your hand, versus a little bit of water versus a little bit of rubbing alcohol and you just blow or put your hand in front of a fan you can see that there is a big temperature difference and i want to show you one more example of this by sharing a short clip of a video i made this video is called science mom's guide to water part seven and i'm just going to show you a short little clip of here we go make sure i'm sharing the full screen so you can do this with thermometers as well. I'm wrapping four thermometers in napkins. You can see that the current temperature is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite warm. We'll leave one of the napkins dry, this is our control, and we'll place oil, water, and rubbing alcohol on the other napkins. Before we turn on the fan, I want you to make a prediction. Which thermometer do you think will have the largest drop in temperature and why? Pause the video and make your prediction. And we, we already kind of know. Let's turn on the fan and find said. out. Ten minutes later, our control and the thermometer wet with oil have not changed, but the thermometer wet with water has dropped over 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and the thermometer wet with rubbing alcohol has dropped even further. All right. Well, that's, that's pretty cool. It's yeah. It's not, not a tiny difference. It's, it's not a tiny big. difference. And this is how swamp coolers work. Though there are different types of refrigeration. And one of the simplest is to have what we call a swamp cooler setup. And if you've ever used a swamp cooler, you know that they make things kind of humid because essentially you have water and you have big sheets of these, you know, things with that are wet. And as air passes over, the water evaporates and it helps cool the air but it also will make things pretty humid because you have all that water vapor coming through. And, and if you want to get it even colder, 
then you have to use a different material besides water. Because you notice that when we blow our hand, what made it colder than water? The rubbing alcohol. The rubbing alcohol yeah. did. So if you had a swamp cooler that had rubbing alcohol in it instead of water, it would make the air much cooler. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Got a thro frog in my throat today. Are there things but even better than rubbing alcohol? There are things even better than rubbing alcohol. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt, Dad. There are things even better than rubbing alcohol that will cool the air even more. And we're going to talk about those in just a second. But first, I see that Jamie asked, what's a swamp cooler? If you have never seen a swamp cooler before, you should definitely look one up. They are a, a cheaper version of an air conditioner. And before we had the invention of air conditioners, this was really the main thing that people would use to try to cool, cool down air. And so you basically just have these sheets that hang inside a box and a fan. And if you have enough sheets with water and a fan and you're blowing the air through, then the air gets cooled because as the water's evaporating, it pulls heat and it pulls the heat from the air because that's what's around it. And this is also why you feel cold when you get out of the shower or out of the swimming pool. Have you ever noticed that you can yes. be perfectly comfortable, the temperature feels great, and then you get all wet and all of a sudden you're shivering and you're cold? You're cold because of the water evaporating. That's it's like, like every time I go to the pool, I don't want to get out because then I just know I'll be freezing. And that's even true sometimes when, when it's really warm outside. It's like, I still just don't want to get out of the pool because I'm going to get cold. Yeah, yeah. And some people use swamp coolers as a cheaper version of an air conditioner because they are a little bit, bit cheaper. But there is a limit to how cold the air will get. They're not going to cool down a house as much as an air conditioner. So now let's talk about Let's talk about fridges, and then we will. We'll. I'll go and turn the chat back on, and we'll do our factor fiction. Okay. So, a fridge actually is a pretty awesome machine. And if you printed our handout, you have a little diagram here that just shows you sort of the basics of how a fridge works. And the most important part of the fridge is the coils that you have and the gas or refrigerant that is used. And back in the day, they used a different types of gases. One of them, you may have heard of it, became rather famous, and it was called a chlorofluorocarbon. And it led to the depletion of the ozone layer. And so now we use different gases than those. But the concept is still the same. You have a gas, and you're going to let it go through a, an expansion device that makes it go all the way into a gas. And when it does, it's essentially, it's like it's evaporating. So it's compressed gas, and then it evaporates and goes to a gas and it pulls in heat. And then you want to use that same refrigerant again. You're gonna put it in a big loop so that you don't have to keep adding refrigerant. You know, your car uses gasoline, but it burns up the gasoline, so you have to always put gas back in. Well, if your refrigerator used a similar, a similar way where you had to put stuff back into it, then you'd have to maintain it all the time. But it actually works in a loop. So once you have that gas in, that gas is never, hopefully, never gonna leak out and you just run it in a loop where you expand it and it evaporates and cools, and then you need to condense it, and then it's going to heat up. If you've ever looked at the back of your fridge, if you have an old fridge, you might have actually seen the coils, and you'd be able to feel that the heat, there's heat coming off those coils. The back of your fridge is hot. So every once in a while, the fridge starts humming. Is, is, that, is that when it's compressing the gas? Yeah, so, so it depends on what type of fridge you have. The type of fridge we have is an older one, and it operates in cycles. And so it has a sensor inside, and once the temperature gets a certain degree, above a certain degree, then it kicks on, and it runs that refrigerant through, and it brings the temperature down. And then it doesn't want to freeze the food. It doesn't want to get too cold, so then it cycles off. And then the temperature warms up a bit, and it kicks on again. And so the temperature inside the fridge is not actually completely flat. It kind of is like a little seesaw, like up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. But right around 40 degrees, that's where our, our, our fridge is set. That's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty neat. And you should tell them real quick about yeah. our dairy farm. Okay, so you guys may not realize this, but when, when you, milk comes out of cows, it's warm. It's body temperature, like almost like cocoa drinking warm. Like hot chocolate. Yeah, yeah. I don't think most people call hot chocolate cocoa. cocoa. Yeah, just you. Just, just me. Oh, yeah. my, my family had a few of those. We, we wouldn't use. <laughs> we, did. we never referred to things as that, the nachos. It was, well, let's have chips and cheese. Okay. And so they'd go to a restaurant and say, can I have some chips and cheese, please, a Mexican restaurant? And then they'd bring him out a plate of chips and then a bowl of cheese on the side. And then his mom would be like, no, we, we, wanted, we wanted the cheese melted. And the waiter would say, so you want nachos? 
<laughs> yeah. Saying, yeah. Coco is a real word. And, All then, right. and then the remote in his family was always called the channel changer. That, that's true. It's like, so. who calls it a channel changer? Everyone in his family. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <clears throat> cocoa, delicious, yummy cocoa. Okay, so it comes out really warm and sort of go into these pipes and it needs to get to the tank. But if it stays warm a long time, that would be bad because you know, bacteria would have a much better environment for growing. And you don't want that, obviously, yeah. with your milk. So somehow it's got to get cooled before it gets to the tank. And it just boggled my mind. Oh man, how do you do that? Because there's a lot of milk, it's really warm. How do you cool a lot of milk in a hurry? And what, what they did was they have this little series of plates. So think about a bunch of dinner plates that were just stacked together. And there's some path that leads maybe through every other one. And between every other one was cold water, was flushing through it. So it would the, this, this milk would flatten out between these plates, so it had lots of surface area, and then it would flow back and forth between these other plates that had cold water running between them. And then by the time it came out into the tank, it was much, much cooler. It was re really remarkable that it could be cooled that fast because it was coming fast. Those, those cows were giving their milk and they, yeah, they, and they with, weren't waiting around. And within seconds, it would all be down to like a refrigeration temperature. Yep. So. That, that was our quick overview of refrigeration. And then I'm going to have Math Dad run and grab our, we have a little experiment demonstration that we could actually not, we could not get to work this morning. So I'm fingers crossed that we'll get it to work for you doing it live. But I think this is a kind of a good example that even, even if you're a scientist, even if you've done dozens of experiments, sometimes you try one that you know should work and you don't get it to work the first time. So I have a glass bottle and a quarter in our fridge. Is that oh, the fridge? Yeah, the quarter's in the fridge. Okay. Right next to where the bottle was. It has, it's, it's yellow because I put clay on it. So it's in disguise. I, we, we had a quarter on top of this glass bottle and we were trying to warm up the air in the bottle, which should make the quarter sort of dance on top. But our first three attempts, it did yeah, not okay. work this is, at this all. This is the quarter I was supposed to find. So I, I put clay on top of it and now, now we'll see. We'll see if we can get it to dance. So in theory, if you put your hands around the bottle that is cold from being in the fridge or being in the freezer, then the air inside the bottle should warm up. And since it warms up and expands, it should actually push the quarter up. And online, I saw several video demonstrations of this with the quarter going deep, 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 just bouncing up and down. Um, wh why would this? Shouldn't the metal parts be touching, or is there, is there some? Well, I don't know. I, I tried putting clay on the bottom of our quarter because I was like, maybe there's a leak. Maybe it's like not sealing right. But this one's a bust for us, you guys. It's not working, and that's that's the way it goes sometimes. I gotta say, you do have to be careful. Just because you saw somebody pull off some amazing science experiment on the internet doesn't mean that they were telling you the full story. <laughs> that uh, I, I, I've definitely seen some some chemistry ones. Are like, look, if you just mix these two things, it glows. And no, it was a lie. They were trying to trick us. Yes, that one that one I think is legitimate because I understand the scientific basis for it. But every now and then I'll have someone forward me a, a short video saying, how does this work? What's the science behind this? And I'll say Photoshop um, because yeah, it's just video editing. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go back now and turn on the chat again in YouTube. May there be rejoicing in the land. We'll have- As well as good behavior. As well as good behavior, yes. And we will have Science Mom Liza, um, I think she's enjoyed being on Facebook and it's been so calm. We'll have her go back over to YouTube to moderate there. And thank you, you guys, for your understanding and your support. I have to say that 99% of the people in the chat are just awesome and really have great feedback. So thank you. And let, it, let us know. And if you don't see the chat on YouTube, just refresh your page and it should come right up. And we're watching to see if we get comments back here. We should have them soon. All right. Are we ready for fact or fiction? We are ready for fact or fiction. All right. Fact one. I'm ready. I'm ready. The unicorn is the national animal of Scotland. <sighs> no way this is true. <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't don't think I'm spoiling too much for you guys, but unicorns are real. It's gotta be well, not, so I mean it's Ireland uh, it would be leprechaun. That, that I'm I'm familiar with that connection. Scotland and unicorns? No, -uh. uh, um, what? Chat's saying true. <laughs> you guys don't know what you're talking about. There's no way this is true. It's false. 
It is actually true. So <laughs> unicorns are not real. Teleporting purple hippopotamuses are not real either. But um, sometimes mythical animals can really be important to a culture. And the unicorn has been on Scotland's crest and in its flag for hundreds of years. And it is the national I would have guessed me the Loch Ness Monster or something, but... <laughs> Unicorn? I, I, yep. I've never heard of that connection and before. Hello to Anna and Nathan and hey, it's Corgi and we're, we're Space Paula. We're seeing the chat on YouTube back again. Good to have you guys back. All right, fact number two. Right. The first refrigerators used ammonia, sulfur dioxide, and methyl chloride as their cooling gases, which were deadly if they leaked. All right, so what, what are those items again? Ammonia, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, and methyl chloride. Lethal if your fridge leaked. That, that, yes. that'd be great. It's so if your fridge leaked, you, it, it would kill you. Yeah, got to have some destruction devices in your house. Ah, uh, those are really weird chemicals. I, I don't know what type of reaction would be going on, but I'm also not enough of a chemist to even pretend. Um, I'm seeing a few trues in the chat. I'm no, saying, I'm seeing a false or two. Ah, it's true. They're saying true. It's I'm true. Gonna, Trust the chat. They are right. It is true. And this is why chlorofluorocarbons, so we, we tend to look back and we say, oh, chlorofluorocarbons, we can't believe people used that in air conditioners and you know destroyed the ozone layer. But <clears throat> compared to what they were using before, the chlorofluorocarbons actually seems amazing because if ammonia, sulfur dioxide, or methyl chloride leaks out of your fridge, you're gonna die. Like those are those are really, really poisonous gases. And so the chlorofluorocarbons, those were not toxic at all. And it wasn't until we found out about the effect with the ozone layer that we were like, oh, okay, we got to develop new ones. And the new ones we have now are a big improvement over, over both. Yeah. I'm just thinking about how different my life would be if I didn't have a refrigerator or if the grocery stores didn't have refrigerators to, oh. to hold the food. So, yeah. Crazy, crazy different. It make, makes a huge difference with where we can store food and what kind of foods we can eat. Refrigeration has yeah, transformed so, the world. So Las Vegas would have a lot fewer people, and I'm, 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 I'm many places would. Yeah. Napoleon was once attacked by hundreds of rabbits. Use the holy hand grenade. Oh, all, right. <laughs> all right. Napoleon was attacked by hundreds of rabbits. There's got to be a cool story behind this one, but th that's so random. Why, why would you make that up if it's not true? But why would it be true? Uh, sure, sure. It, it's true. It is. Ashley and Camille and Michael all had it right. Napoleon was once attacked by hundreds of rabbits, and here's how it happened. <laughs> he asked, he wanted to have a rabbit hunt and asked one of his generals to set up a rabbit hunt. And instead of going and like trapping a bunch of wild rabbits, the general went to and pretty much took like all the rabbits from the local farmers in the area. So these were actually pets. So, rabbits that had captive born rabbits and then they set them up around a field and they released some reports say there were thousands of rabbits i mean we're talking a lot of rabbits that got released all at once and they instead of like running away so that they could then be chased and the hunt could begin they all swarmed napoleon and his generals and i think at first they were amused but they quickly became really alarmed as they like were literally like covered in a horde of hungry <laughs> rabbits and they had to like run away and flee to their carriages and they all like drove off <laughs> so it's true all right i'd love to see that video <laughs> yeah the coldest temperature ever recorded on earth was negative 63 degrees celsius <sighs> that's awfully cold negative 63 degrees celsius uh, that, so this is obviously coldest temperature naturally occurring yes temperature Okay, it would have to be in Antarctica, and you know that sounds that sounds kind of plausible to me. That's it's cra crazy cold, colder than I would have ever experienced or ever would want to even get close to experiencing. But my understanding is it can get awfully cold there, so I'm going to say true. That's actually false. Yeah. The, the this is the coldest temperature ever recorded in Canada, but the coldest temperature ever recorded on in Antarctica was even colder than that. And it was cold enough, so this one, this one, negative 63 degrees Celsius, negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit, that is cold. But the coldest temperature ever recorded in Antarctica at the Vostok Research Station was colder than the temperature that dry ice freezes at, colder than negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, man. Yeah. Super, you, you, super cold. You named one of those in Celsius and the other one in Fahrenheit. <clears throat> that was sneaky, trying to make it sound colder. But yeah, yeah. They're, they're both there. They're both there on the, on the fact. So that is our fact and fiction for today. And 
<clears throat> Excuse me, let me share with you our art prompt real fast because I forgot to do that at the beginning and then we'll go on to our math lesson. So yesterday we had an Archimedes screw as our engineering challenge and make a fractal and we'll be showcasing those at the end of our show. And then today our art prompt is actually to make a glue window. Well, how does it so you drip thick layers of glue onto? Wait a second, did I do that right? I don't know. I hope I did. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. I did that right, okay. Blue, and, blue window. and a catapult. So you use tape or what? So, so you you get you get a frame. You know what? I'm I'm gonna let you go on. I gotta double check something because I thought this okay, okay. was actually next. Good, because I want I want to get to my math lesson. Alrighty. All right. So today we're gonna get to something called Pick's theorem. But before we do, we need to talk again about area, and we we. we Got good area last time. So the area of a rectangle was the base times the height or the length times the width. But what if we had a triangle? Can we find the area of a triangle? And I kind of hate to spoil this for you because it would be a really good exercise to work out on your own, but I'm, I'm going to spoil it because I have a limited amount of time here. Well, it turns out a triangle is going to eat up the half of the area in a rectangle. So the area of a triangle would be one half of the base times the height, or one half of the length times the, the width. Of the, so you, you've got to make sure you the height here is perpendicular to the, the base. So you've got to meet it at a 90 degree angle. So one half of the base times the height. So that might kind of make sense. If it's making up half of a box, it would be half of the area of that box. And there are lots of other shapes, of course, other than rectangles and triangles. But here's a cool fact. Anytime you have a polygon, so if I just stick some points here in the plane and I start connecting them, well, it's possible for me to then chop this thing up further into triangles. So I can just pick some points and, and connect them, and suddenly I've got triangles. So if I'm really good at finding the area of triangles, I might be able to find the area of the entire shape. All right, so now we're going to talk about points. Can I, Go ahead. So. Um, that art prompt is correct. I was looking at next week's things and I had this moment of like, oh no, maybe I made a mistake and put one of next week's early. But yeah, so you, you take glue and it can be Elmer's glue or any other type of glue and do a really thin layer and you can make your own window if you put it on a piece of glass or plastic that's transparent. All right. So <laughs> these points are, are laid out in nice grid. Yeah. Think of these as point, points in the plane with integer coordinates if you want, but it's possible to make various shapes here by connecting the points. And you could do this if you had, say, a string, and so if you had nails nailed into a board, you could wrap the string around those nails. And in fact, I even, I just did a Google search for something called a geoboard. And if you look up a geoboard, what you will see is lots of applets, things like this. So I'm going to take these rubber bands, and I'm just going to set it here, and I can drag it out at each end, and I can actually create shapes. And just think of it as just wrapping a rubber band around these pegs that are on a board. And there, it works because it's in a, in a nice square grid where we're going to talk about how to find the areas of a figure like this. And I'll tell you, at first glance, this looks terribly difficult. How, how in the world would I chop that up? Well, I could chop it into triangles or maybe even some rectangles and some triangles. And you know what? We, I think we'd eventually get there. But boy, it would take quite a while. And we'd have to be kind of clever because... Yeah, figuring out the actual base and height for some of these would be very difficult. It might actually be easier to look at the exterior and find the area on the outside and then subtract the area on the inside. But it turns out there's a really cool theorem 
that we're going to be able to use to find the area inside of a figure like this. So I'm going to redraw this one more time with a few more dots so that it's big enough. And it, it, this theorem will only work for a geoboard shape like this where you've got your dots in a grid. All right, so I'm just going to try to make a shape. All right, cool. And I want you to notice something. Some of the points fell inside this border. Some of them fell outside. And some of the points fell on the border itself. So let, let's see if we can count all those points. So I'm going to call this the, the boundary. So B, whoops, probably can't see. Yeah, B equals boundary. And I'm going to use capital I for interior, meaning the inside of the shape. Uh, lights are bright. Sorry. All right. So how many boundary points were there? And how many points were there on the interior? So on the boundary, Is I count. No, it's the ones up high, but we're good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine boundary points. So in this case, I would say B equals nine. And we would the number even interior points, I count one, two, three, four, five points on the interior. And here is what Pick's theorem says. So point it this way. Pick's theorem oh. right, Pick's theorem says that the area will be equal to, we take the number of interior points plus we take half of the number of boundary points and then we have to subtract one from that. All right, so what does that mean? for this particular figure. So the area of this shape should be, we take i, which was five, five plus the number of boundary points was nine divided by two and then minus one. All right, so that's five plus nine divided by two is four and a half. So I could write it as four and one half, but then we subtract one. So five plus four, and a half is nine and a half minus one is eight and a half units or 8.5 units. We're able to get the area inside of this lattice figure just by using this formula. And all this formula had us do was count the actual points that were on the inside and that were on the boundary. That's pretty cool. Isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And let's actually, let's just look at a simple case to see, does this formula even make any sense? What if I picked a really simple little box here. All right, so on this, in this case, there were six boundary points and there were no interior points. In that case, what does Pick's theorem say the area would be? Well, I do the number of interior points was zero, plus the number of boundary points was six, divided by two, minus one. Aha, uh -huh. well, six divided by two, so that's uh, three minus one for a grand total of two. Is the area of that actually two units, science mom? Yep. Yep, the base is two, the height is one. Yeah, the area does work out to be two. So that, this, this remarkable formula will work every single time. For any shape, no matter how bizarre. That's right, as long as those coordinates fit that geoboard grid. And yeah, you can find the area of any lattice figure using this. That's really so, cool. So yeah, I want, wanted to teach you guys about Pick's theorem. So yeah, g give it a try. See if you can draw a weird looking shape, the, a polygon that fits that geoboard style grid and see if you can find its area. And my guess is uh, <clears throat> most college students would really struggle to get the right answer for some weird shapes because they don't know Pick's theorem. <laughs> That's uh, pretty awesome. All right. All right, I've got a riddle for you, Math Dad. I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm made of eight letters, but I hold a ninth inside. 
Eight of eight letters, but I pulled the ninth inside. Okay. Pay a very small fee and send me for a ride. Uh, eight letters and write, paying for stamp to mail a letter. Letter L E T T E R S is not eight letters. Thing. Nope. Uh, um, what? what? Larissa has it. Jesse has it. An envelope? Carrie has it. Yep. Envelope is eight letters long and it has a letter inside. And it has a letter ah! inside. I was, okay, I was, I was barking up the right tree, but yeah, okay. That's a really good one, actually. Yep. Made of eight letters, hold a ninth inside an actual letter, like a letter you mail, pay a very small fee, and send me for a ride. Very nice. I thought that one was outstanding. Now, yesterday, we did a math, our math mystery was actually a game called the game Count to 18. Let us know in the chat if you had a chance to play it. And I'll tell you, the first time I played this with Math Dad, he totally stumped me the first the first couple rounds we played. I was like, wait I, a I, second. I kept winning over and over and over. And, and... Yeah, it, it, it's one of those games that's really fun when you know how to win each time because the other person's like, hey. How did you do that? Oh, well, fine, I'll win this time. And yeah, per per perfect game for playing with kids. But it's also a really fun game to try to analyze because it turns out you can figure out how to win. And we're, we're going to try this using backtracking. And Shweta and uh, Logan said that they played it yesterday, loved it, and thought it was a lot of fun. All right. Excellent. Okay. And Maureen too. So uh, yesterday we were supposed to just play a random game and then science mom <laughs> who actually knew the winning strategy, yeah. well, she wasn't paying attention when I said that we were not going to show the winning strategy and yet she did exactly the winning strategy <laughs> and I was like, Arr! all right. Sorry. Sometimes when I'm watching the chat and thinking about what's happening next, I don't really pay attention to what Matt Dad's saying, but it goes both ways. We both do that to each other. Yeah. Um, it's a really interesting question right here. Um, if numbers have no end, why is there no infinite degree of refrigeration? Why, why can't the temperature reach negative a thousand degrees? So there, there, there is a lower bound. Um, there are two, two bounds. One is absolute zero. So heat, there is no such thing as cold. There's only such thing as heat or the absence of heat. And the heat is molecules moving. So the air around us right now is made up of molecules. And if those molecules start moving faster, the temperature of the air increases. And when you're pulling heat out of a place, then how much heat you pull kind of determines what the temperature drop is. But you can't get below absolute zero. At absolute zero, the molecules are not moving. That's what we think theoretically, but I don't believe that absolute zero has been achieved yet, even in laboratory settings. It's kind of a theoretical limit to temperature. Yeah, I think we've gotten pretty close we as have far as close. The, the numbers go. All right, so the game, count to 18 game. You're counting by either Ooh. ones, or two is the other good, good yeah, question. Several, several people have good questions about our counting game, and Science Pokemon Latina says that they figured out how it worked. Nice. Awesome. Okay, so let, let, let's play it one more time. And, and we'll Am do, I going to do the winning strategy this time or not the winning strategy? Uh, let's do not the winning strategy. Which, okay. All right, so do you want you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16? 17, 18. Uh, all right. So you can either count one number or two numbers each time, and whoever lands on 18 is the winner. And Science Mom won that round. Okay. So now Science Mom's going to use the optimal strategy. All right. So I'll start us off. One, two. Three. Four. Five, six. Seven, eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven, twelve. Thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh -huh. Do you notice anything about the numbers that I landed on? Okay, let, let, let's play it one more time so, and see if they can notice what numbers you're landing on. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Ah, so what's <laughs> happening here, you might have noticed. She's landing on a multiple of three every single time. And, and you could also think, if I count one number, she counts two. Or if I count two, she counts one. Mm -hmm. It turns out this is a game where the second player has the advantage. If Science Mom does things perfectly, she would not lose that game at all. However, if she messes up even one time and doesn't end on a multiple of three, 
then I will steal that multiple of three, and then I have the winning strategy. I can stay on a multiple of three. Yep. Shout out to Amy and Deepa and several others who I saw that had that list of that same strategy. Yep. Multiples of three. Yeah. Okay. So that makes you wonder, huh? How would this game, how could one analyze that? How does one figure that out? And the answer is you probably figure this out by backtracking from 18. So you notice if, if I end my turn on 16 or 17, then Science Mom knows that she can win on the next turn. So 16 and 17 are not safe numbers, but 15, aha, 15 is safe. And not only that, but if I land on 15, then the next person would have to end on the unsafe numbers of 16 or 17. So that makes us think, ah, if I land on 15, I can win. Well, then we'd work backwards from 15. We'd say, ah, well, 13 and 14 aren't, are not safe because then I, if, if I landed on that, my opponent could get to 15. So you work backwards and you discover, oh, 15 is safe, 12 is safe, 9 is safe, and you could work all the way back to zero and figure out that uh, you want to land on the multiples of three. And you can also figure out in the process that the second player has the advantage. But we could play this game differently. What if instead of using the, you could count either by ones or twos, what if you could count by ones, twos, or threes? In that case, who has the winning strategy? Hmm. That's not obvious. You want, to, you want to play this one with me real quick, Science Mom? Okay. You, know, you want to go first or second? Um, I'll go second. All right. One, two. Three. Four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine. Ten. Eleven, twelve. Thirteen, fourteen. Uh, fifteen. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Woo! That's weird. I didn't. I, mean, yep. I didn't change the target, did I? No, you didn't. Okay, good. Sorry, I panicked there because yeah, it's possible. To, Eighteen is just a, a number. We could have picked any ending number. Okay, so I, I kind of figured out the winning strategy there because I know know how how this works. <laughs> but yeah, it, it turns out that. If you backtracked from tw uh, from 18, you'd figure out, oh, 14 is safe, 10 is safe, 6 is safe, and 2 is safe. Oh. So the first player has the advantage. I wanted to land on 2, so I wanted to go first. And I did. Once I landed on 2, she didn't stand a chance. Nice. Yeah. So can we make, uh, can we figure out how to systematically analyze these games? I, I want us to make up yet another game here. And we're going to see if we can do this by backtracking. All right, so I'm going to reframe this question. I like to think of uh, this game as us maybe moving a game token along a board. So we start zero, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. All right, so 14 here is gonna be our final slot. We're stuck with whatever size of game board I just made. All right, cool. So the winner of this game is going to be the person who manages to land the game token on 14. I, I planned to go higher, but I ran out of space. So th this is where we'll stop. So in this case, we could say, all right, the player can go either one space or two spaces. And then, that, that, then it would be just like the game of 18, right? Mm -hmm. Except we were only going to 14 this time. But when we think about it this way, it might allow us to organize our work slightly differently. Okay, so new game. So we want to get to 14. So land on 14 to win. Oh, darn. It's all right. Yeah, land on 14 to win. All right, so what are the legal moves you can make? Let's say you can count by plus one, or you can count by twos, or you could count by fours but not threes. Ah, so I'm just, just making that up as one possible number. Um, yeah, I'm uh, hopeful that this will work, but I'm not positive. All right, so I'm going to put a little dot here. I'm gonna say, I want to land on the dots. The dots are those safe squares that we were talking about. All right, so what are the unsafe squares? Who can, from where could we get to a dot? Well, from, from there. here, because we could go plus one from here, or looks like right here. So this one, if you land on that one, then you're going to lose because the next person can get there to 14. No, the, no, no. I'm, I'm saying the if you land on any of the X's, 
I, then, it's, then I get to go next. I win because okay. I can move to the, the dot. All right. And but, but, oh, let, let's just say you can't go past the ends of the board. All right. So in that case, what about this one? You can't do the plus four. Your only legal moves are to go t from here to an X. So this one's actually a... Uh, you want to land here because then your opponent would have to move to an X. So that one gets a dot. So now we're going to work backwards. So this one is unsafe. This one's unsafe. And this one's unsafe because we could count one, two, three, or, or sorry, one, two, or four from these, and we would land on a dot. But this one, oh, turns out that's a safe square. Okay, working backwards. Uh, this one and this one are unsafe. I see a pattern. This guy will be safe. Yeah, I, I am seeing the pattern here as well. Aha. And then we can count two. So this this is what we what our game board looks like. So you want to start on an X because you can end your turn on a dot. And ultimately we want to end on a dot. So the winning strategy here would be to try to land on the dot. So you count up to two. So let, let, let's let's play a game with these rules and I'll, I'll cheat by looking at this board here. And so you oh, sorry, do you want to go first or second, Sax Mom? Um, I want to go first. Okay, so go ahead. Oh, wait a second. Um, <laughs> all right, one, one, two. Okay. Uh, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight. Nine. Ten, eleven. Twelve, thirteen. Fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. So when she landed on a dot, I had no choice but to land on an X. It didn't matter. What what I did, how smart I am, I've lost the game if she knows this winning strategy. So it, it turns out in this case, you wanted to be the first player because when you start on an X, you can end on a dot. And you got to be smart about it. You actually have to land on that dot. But then once it's on a dot, I have no choice on my turn but to land on an X. And that's because we backtracked from the end all the way to the beginning and we classified every single square one way or the other. So I, I like this formulation better than the counting out loud. Although if you count out loud, it would be much harder to actually see this pattern. Although the pattern ultimately ended up being very similar to the game of 18. We could make up different rules here and there would be a different game to analyze. And in fact, where's the sheet? I, I do have, for my math mystery today, I have a challenge for you. And... It it is. All right. Okay. So in this case, we are going to play the same game. And I was going to formulate it differently because you, you could also think of this as a, maybe you have 20 beans and you're trying to, you can take either one bean or two beans each time. And that would be another formulation of our game of 18. But um, <clears throat> so in this case, we want to count to 20 and the possible ways that we can count are, so let's see, you can do plus five, you could do plus two, or you could do minus one. You could actually go backwards. Okay. And I, I like this. I like the way that you did it on here with the bean game. I think it makes it fun. Yeah. So you, you want to play this really yeah, quick? Yeah. All right. So we actually have 20 uh, beans here, these, these magnets. Um, all right. So the person who lands on 20 wins, but you're not allowed to go past 20 and you're not allowed to go below z zero because we only have these 20 to deal with. So the person who takes the last magnet wins. The person who takes the last magnet wins. All right. So let's, let's try this. I'm going to start out by taking five. All right. I'm going to take two. I'm going to take one, two, three, four, five again. All right. I'm going to put one back. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. If I take five... And there are only four left. Oh, I think you've got it. Okay, I'm going to take two. And now I can take two. You and that means two. that I land on 20. Yeah. I, I took the last bean. That's or right. the last magnet. Yeah, so th this can be interesting. What if the, what if we'd landed on 19? Or sorry, sorry, sorry. What, what if there'd only been one left? Then I would have to put one the back. The only legal move would be to put one back. And, and then I would take two. So there's some interesting strategy going on here. If you draw it out, just like we had drawn with the dots and the X's, that's how I would recommend learning to solve this problem. So 
who has the advantage, the first player or the second player? And mm -hmm. what is that winning strategy? See if you can figure this guy out. And it, it'll take some time to actually draw it out and reason your way through it. So this comes awesome. from, from a branch of mathematics called game theory, where um, yeah, you're actually trying to use logic to determine the outcome of a game. So hold up, Math Dad. There's a whole branch of mathematics called game theory. Indeed. This sounds like mathematicians are just playing games. Um, well, there are definitely some good, good. There are some good games to, to be played there, but um, no, no, mathematicians actually study. They're trying to figure out. All right, well, you could even think of the economy as a game where you're trying to minimize or maximize something under various constraints, and they try to make up models and actually make predictions based off of this. So, yeah, game theory is a legitimate branch of mathematics. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Now, I, I will point out real fast, there is a typo on our art prompt. It says drip a thick layer of glue. That's supposed to be thin <gasps> layer of glue. Thin layer. Um, because if you drip a thick layer, it will, take, it will take a very long time to dry. And you can use tape to kind of do margins in your window, or you can do glue across the hole. And we will, I'm looking forward to seeing your submissions for those. And we'll, we'll even do it ourselves and show you our windows tomorrow. But let's, before we do our art showcase, let's show you the catapults that we made. Uh -huh. Because our engineering challenge today is to make a catapult. And we have two catapults here that we made. And then I thought it would be fun to see if we could hop them over a block. So Math Dad, if you'll help me just adjust that right there. We have some blocks on our table here. We'll adjust the view down so you can see. And we'll move a few of these off. And we have pennies. I'm going to put, let's leave a wall here so we don't shoot them off the table. All right. And then our challenge is going to be, can we can we catapult the pennies over, over the block? And you'll, you'll see, we just used a bunch of rubber bands. And rubber bands and popsicle sticks is how this catapult is made. And it has a little lid to a container to hold the penny. And then Math Dad's design is really simple. We just have two rulers and then popsicle sticks in between. All right. All right, you can start cheering for your favorite contestant in the chat. Go team science mom. Ha! Oh, I landed on top. Yours too? All I right, landed right. on top too, all right, round two. All right, we'll call it a draw. All right. Oh, again? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna try going back a little further. Oh, did you see it? Here you go, you cleared the whole it table. It was amazing. All right, you gotta watch. I, it didn't count, I didn't see it. <laughs> there were no witnesses. Okay, that, that, that was pretty good. Ah! Oh. <laughs> so, All right. Let's look at the design and Math Dad, do you have a theory about why, why did this one go further than this one? What's the main difference here? Um, I, I think this one just didn't go far enough up. Let me let me change this. I'm I'm gonna shove this even further to the end so it's it might stick up a little higher. I try try one more time here. It it did go over. I, I, I got over. It. Yeah, but yeah, I I just think I mean, maybe if these had been shorter, I'd have actually had more luck. But I I, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. So this this is a favorite engineering challenge of mine. If you have never made a catapult before. I hope you I hope you will. It's really fun to see what adjustments you can make and how far you can you can move a projectile. Um, pennies work really well, but you can really use anything. I'd say just raid your recycle bin, see what materials you have around your house, and then make a catapult. And of course, you can share photos of your catapult or videos with us online. We would love to see your work. Indeed. And then um, I see a couple couple of comments in the chat, so, so mine gets pulled back further because. I, I think so. Like if you look at the angle here, there's a larger triangle of space in front of these these this support on mine than there is on this one. Your base was actually a little bit taller too. It so is. You this have... base here is a little taller. So uh -huh. I think that I think this is the main difference. That this base that is providing that resistance is taller on this one. I think that's why it went went farther. Cool. All right. Are you ready for an art showcase? I am. Yes, I, lo I love fractals, so I'm really curious what you guys came up with. So there. we had some great fractal-inspired art. Not all of them are true fractals, but they are all definitely fractal-inspired and quite lovely. Sean went full Coke Snowflake on me there. Yes. Oh. Sorry, I'm not Ooh. at the beginning. Now I'm at the beginning. Okay. Oh! 
So isn't this one great? I love the simplicity. So Emma Ray and her mom, awesome job. It That's just, actually 3D because they just cut out the pages. Yeah, they just cut that out, is so clever. Cut out the paper. So I thought that was so fun and re really well done. Oh, so it looks awesome. Gotta try that. This is a photo of a plant, but it definitely has a fractal-like <laughs> pattern. When you look from the top, I thought that looked amazing. It almost looks like that yeah, can't be real, but there are several species of agave and different flowering plants that have a cool spiral pattern like oh, that. Oh, nice. And then um, the, this broccoli variety. Isn't that cool? Is that the broccolini? Uh-huh. That... Or not, not broccolini. I think it's Romanesco broccoli. Oh, man. Yeah. Neat, huh? Yeah. And then this one is inspired from Ooh. nature as well. Ammonite fossil? Did it, oh, this is a literal fossil. Yeah, there. literal fossil. You did the yeah. drawing from it. And All right. Ooh. Penelope, very nice. Yep, and and great, great workshop. Oh, yeah, so that's what the Coke snowflake actually looks like when, when, once you've built it. Yep. Yeah, so it's like uh, each one's a triangle with triangles on the sides and then triangles on the sides. Yep, triangles on those sides and triangles on those sides. All the way to infinity. Oh. And great work, Grace Gaming World. Good for Legos. That's, that's clever. And we've got some great spider webs. So <laughs> Graham did one, and we had oh, a couple I others of a as well. A spider web, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it definitely has a fractal-like pattern. Oh, I believe got these tangent circles here, making a really neat pattern. Like Head it, in. yes. Ooh. Good job, Lucas. So, you, or Luca? Yeah, they, it's partly hidden by our little window thing. Yeah, so th this one even has a name. This one's called the Serpinski uh, triangle. Ooh. And if you guys remember Pascal's triangle from last lesson, it turns out that. If you look at numbers that are, say, multiples of three or multiples of five, you often get these same types of patterns inside of Pascal's triangle. Interesting. Yep. And then Carissa drew this beautiful Ooh. pattern here. It kind of reminds me of a, of a flower. Yeah, spiral leaves. Yeah. And Madison. Madison. Great pyramid of blocks here. I love it. Ivan. Beautiful coloring here. Ivan, nicely done. Yeah, that reminds me of one of my math mystery problems. Yeah. Ivan. Simon did two. Love these. Yep, swirls and oh, the and branches. Trees. Yeah, branches. Yeah. Trees often do have fractal patterns to their branches. I love the colors in this one. Yeah. Beautiful symmetric design. Great spider web, web Edwin, Ooh. and a hypnotizing, hypnotizing fractal. fractal. Ooh, babesh. Very nice. And then Sanjana, I love the honeycomb, honeycomb pattern. Honeycomb definitely does have a very geometric regular pattern. That's right. Ooh, very Kylie. nice, Kylie. And then here are some um, Archimedes screws, uh, siphons that I'm using to water a plant. And you don't have to, if you don't have PVC pipe, a uh, paper towel roll will work yeah, just yeah. as well. I'm super curious if these actually worked. I think they did. I think they did. Yeah. Well, very so, nice. And last, um, I will answer a great question that came in. The question was, is there, if there's more food in the fridge, Will the food be less cold or more, more cold? So what difference does it make with what's in your fridge? And the answer is, and this is really kind of interesting to think about, your fridge and your freezer will actually work less hard and be a little more efficient if they have material inside them because when you open the door, the cold air is going to fall out. A lot of that air, since it's cold and it's more dense, as soon as you open the door, the air is going to come out and if the air comes out and warm air goes in, then when you close the door, your fridge has to work a bit harder to get that temperature back down. But if you have a lot of items in your fridge so that then when you open the door, the cold air does not come out, then those items are going to already be at a cold temperature. And when you close the door, your fridge does not have to work as hard to keep it cold. So even if the cold air does go out, it'll get cool back down a lot faster just because, because everything is already cooled. Yeah. And, and you don't have as much air space in there if it's mostly full of objects. Now, if you have a freezer where the door is open like that, the door opens out, same thing. But if you have a chest freezer where you pull it out and it's like a box where you're looking in from the top, then you don't lose as much air because that cold air just sits and it stays in. Oh. So it kind of depends on what type of door you have. But in general, your, your fridge is going to stay cooler and not have to use as much energy to cool things if there are objects inside the fridge. I'm kind of singing a song, I don't know the words, I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. I thought just maybe we might go through the whole episode without you remembering, but yeah. you remembered. <laughs> nice try, Sam. <Sansmo. laughs> nice try. 
<laughs> and we have had such fabulous submissions come in. And tomorrow we are going to have a video ready for you guys showcasing everyone else singing the song, which I'm really excited to share with you. It's been really fun to see all of the, all of, yeah, so many, so many people singing it all over the world. So you should feel proud of yourself. Your song has infected, infected the world. Yeah, it's hard to resist the, the pool of a great tune. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you tomorrow. Quick reminder that our art prompt is to make a stained glass window using glue, and if you don't have Elmer's glue, you can use any type of glue, just to add some food coloring. And then the engineering challenge is to make a catapult. And tomorrow we are going to be learning all about astronomy with a special episode that was designed by one of our viewers, Nicole Weir, and we're really excited.